Early Research Stories. Your podcast uncovering stories from influential figures in the field of learning and instruction. What motivated them to become researchers? What are their next projects? And what advice do they have for young researchers of early the European Association for Research on Learning and Instruction? Your host, Stefan Siegel. Today's guest in the Early Research Stories podcast is the wonderful Krina Damscher. Krina is an associate professor at the Department of Education and currently vice dean of innovation and digitalization at the Faculty of Educational Science at the University of Oslo in Norway. She is associate editor of the journal Frontline Learning Research and the Journal of the Learning Sciences. She also served as a member of the early executive committee and as a SIG coordinator for several years. Krina is PI of several projects funded by the Research Council of Norway on collaborative problem solving and multimodal learning analytics, as well as interdisciplinary learning and teaching in higher education and schools. In this podcast, she elaborates on her career, her involvement in early and her current and future research. I'm very delighted that Krina is here today, and I do hope that you enjoy this episode. So, hello, Krina. Hello, Stefan, and thank you very much for this invitation to this memorable podcast series. It's great that you're here. Thanks for taking the time. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Oslo. I'm actually sitting in my office after enjoying a two week summer holiday in July and ah, actually fun. preparing for starting the fall term here in Oslo. Ah, that sounds really lovely. Um, last time we met was at the early SIG1 and SIG4 conference in Cadiz in Spain where you treated us with a wonderful joint keynote together with Naomi Winston. Um, today, I really look forward to our conversation right now and to your experiences and insights. Let's start with our first thematic area, your personal career, your journey, and your motivation for becoming a researcher. Could you tell our listeners and me how and why you started your academic research career? Yes, uh, this could become actually a very long story, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, for those who don't know, I am Romanian born. Um, I grew up and um, studied in Romania, in Cluj-Napoca, which is the northwestern part of Romania in the heart of Transylvania. I studied pedagogy and language and literature with a specialization in linguistics. Uh, so I trained to become a teacher and actually was a teacher for uh, two years before taking, uh, moving on to take a master degree um, in, in a new program in the Netherlands. So there I started, um, uh, I studied um, educational sciences and new media. And that was part of an interest in research that I've intuitively developed during my teacher training years in Romania. Uh, training which was not very much focused on uh, developing research skills. But I always felt that I, there is something more to, than just to the teaching profession, which is a, teach, a profession that I admire deeply. But yet I felt that I, I, I need to learn more about understanding the world, understanding knowledge, understanding how we learn, because that was always somehow um, intuitively my interest. Uh, so, um, during my master um, uh, studies in the Netherlands at the University of Utrecht, um, I, I was trained in uh, research, uh, conducting research. I've basically almost started my, my, uh, my, my studies from, from the beginning, uh, taking the basic uh, subjects in, in research methodology. And I definitely developed uh, a lot for research and uh, an even more um, a deeper interest in, in uh, research in uh, social sciences and especially educational research. And I had the privilege to, to study with um, scholars in, in the educational uh, research field that really had this talent and probably it was also the experience to, to um, um, sort of transfer the passion um, and um, uh, qualities uh, needed for, for being a good researcher. 
So during that, uh, those studies, I also started working as a research assistant at the um, uh, Center for Learning in Interaction at the University of Oslo. I uh, wrote my master thesis there and uh, after working there as a research assistant for two years, I applied for a PhD position in a large European uh, project. And from there, my, my, my actual research journey started. Um, I, did, I do think it's important to mention the background of it because um, I, have, I have a mixed, um, sort of a mixed academic background. Uh, also being born in Eastern Europe kind of shaped the way I think about about not only research, but the world, obviously, and education. So it's kind of, I have a, a sort of somehow a broad understanding of, of uh, challenges in education and in the way research should be reaching out into the world. So to just uh, continue that, that top, uh, on that topic of my research career, I finally finalized my PhD uh, studies in Oslo with Professor Stan Ludwigsen. Um, and I wrote my thesis on a topic of collaborative learning and specifically on learning in small uh, small groups in higher education, after which I continue with, in a postdoctoral position um, here in Oslo, uh, continuing also my research in the field of higher education and professional higher education. I had uh, also the, the privilege of working with colleagues who um, start work or are active in the field of workplace learning. So my, my research horizon and topical interest uh, broadened uh, into that area. Um, and in after two years of being a postdoctoral um, fellow, I received a tenured position at um, one of the departments in the Faculty of Educational Sciences in Oslo, um, teacher education and school research, where I've been active for a year. And then I moved on to another tenure position in the Department of Education, where I basically returned to the topic I've been studying um, before higher education, learning and instruction in higher education and university pedagogy, um, which, uh, which is the position I'm still in at the moment. So I, I believe that my trajectory was I, somehow atypical. Um, I started my, uh, my studies and my professional sort of training without really uh, knowing that I will end up doing research. Uh, it was a long journey. Um, and uh, yeah, I experienced that as a long journey. At the same time, it was a very enriching journey uh, of, and of sustained, that contains sustained work, but also very rewarding experiences, as I said, from, um, from being part of so many environments um, and sort of in, in so many also geographic contexts that kind of help me understand um, the complexities of the educational field uh, and um, the way we as researchers can actually engage those in a productive way. Wow, thank you, Krina. It's so interesting to hear your reflections on your personal journey, uh, your milestones and your motivation for becoming a researcher. When you think of the beginning of your career, what would you say, what was your most memorable early career accomplishment? Yes, I, again, I mean, there, there are many things that could be named here. Uh, a, a researcher career is um, a collection of small accomplishments. But if I think of my very early years, um, I would definitely name um, the publication of my first research article, which is always a, a joy and a victory for any PhD student, right? It's a milestone that indicates that you're on the good way and your research is acknowledged and so on. But in my case, it was more than just that. I published my first article in the Journal of the Learning Sciences, which is not a European um, uh, journal, but um, it is a journal that's kind of offer, it is an outlet for also uh, for research conducted um, around the world on learning sciences and an outlet that also allows um, publishing work that's sort of um, long-term, longitudinal, uh, including formative interventions, and not least allows uh, publishing longer articles. Uh, so it, 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 it's a journal that kind of offers an arena for 
for developing researchers uh, also when it comes to studies that are a little less mainstream like my research has been my, my doctoral research has been and um, it was also publishing in that journal was of course a uh, sort of a confirmation that um, my research is valuable enough for the field of learning sciences but also an eye-opener in the type of research that I was really interested in which is still is um, um, studying learning processes um, and the formative or the ways in which through formative interventions uh, we can support learning processes and um, sort of uh, incremental development in a formative uh, fashion. So from, from that moment onwards, I pursued that line of research and I've, I've developed both um, sort of uh, expertise and knowledge and skills in conducting that type of research, which is uh, design-based research. And I feel that has, that has been a very uh, good opportunity and a good choice to, to develop that, that type of expertise because I, I, I see it as a sort of a complementary to the um, uh, mainstream research that's being conducted in the field of learning and instruction um, and uh, as a great learning experience as well. I absolutely agree. I think this is highly valuable um, and also super interesting to hear this. Um, could you tell us about a person or a mentor who made an impact on you or set you on your current path? I I don't have such a person. I I have. It's interesting to think about it. You kind of your question kind of prompted me to think about it. Can I identify one person that was really the mentor in my career? I my work. Also, currently, is highly collaborative, and it's been like this always. And of course, I've had experienced scholars uh, that guided me, but I, I think I can identify groups of of scholars uh, that sort of um, functioned as mentors for me, and from whom I've learned a lot, and whom I still admire. And I think I could name three three groups, let's say. Um, and the first one is. A group of um, supervisors from the University of uh, Utrecht University, where I started my PhD, uh, and these are Professor Paul Kirchner, um, Professor Geisbert uh, Erkens, and Associate Professor in those times Jerry Anderson. None of them is, is at, in Utrecht anymore, but they were the ones that kind of started my career. And uh, I used to be a very insecure um, young scholar, and uh, they've they've kind of guided my my first steps in different ways. They are very different scholars, uh, but they they sort of taught me, um, you know, the first uh, the first uh, things to one needs to know in in uh, in. Uh, in this profession and also encouraged me to continue. So for example, Professor Paul Kishner uh, encouraged me to submit my article in the journal, to the Journal of the Learning Sciences, something I would have not done without his encouragement. So I'm, I'm grateful to them. Um, the, um, the next, let's say, um, mentor was uh, Professor Stan Ludwigsen, with whom I actually finalized my, my PhD in Oslo. Uh, who has always been a very uh, good supervisor, a good mentor, and I always praise his very uh, in-depth and thoughtful uh, feedback comments. Uh, and I definitely am grateful for his further guidance beyond the PhD period. And then uh, sort of a more atypical type of, perhaps not guidance, but it was some sort of form of collaborative mutual um, um, yeah guidance and mentorship was from with a Finnish group which at the time of my PhD um, uh, doctoral studies uh, was led by Kai Hakkarainen at Helsinki University. Uh, this was a group of, of PhD uh, students as well but we we learned a lot from each other and I can name Professor Hanni Mokunen who's also a SIG4 member who is a long-time collaborator. We have uh, research projects together, but our collaboration started in that period and uh, we sort of mentored each other uh, for uh, um, throughout years. That's again very interesting to hear. Um, I think collaboration and exchange is a key factor in um, academic careers. Um, let's move on to our second thematic area, the research in your field and future research 
What do you think, what have been the major changes in your fields of research since you've been working on it? Yeah, this is a very interesting question also in the in light of the current developments in the educational research field and in, in education in general. I am assuming that you're referring to uh, changes in the field of research on student and teacher um, uh, or teaching in higher education. I would I would refer back to one of uh, one of my answers um, related to focus on studying learning processes, uh, which was, as I said, always my my in, in, in at the center of my uh, research interests, but was not always acknowledged in the same way in in the field of uh, research on learning and instruction, perhaps. And I believe that in the last in the past years. Uh, perhaps for last decade, also in the European context and in the early community, um, there's been a, an opening of the research space for um, research on learning processes, and in this case in higher education, not uh, only on, on learning outcomes. I believe that um, we have a field that has developed historically in, in building on psychological approaches uh, and we know the type of research that has been somehow prominent in the field focusing mostly on on effects and uh, <laughs> somehow standardized uh, approaches to research uh, from a more positivistic perspective which are obviously at, at the core of our field and very valuable but that that I think it was the there was a need for a sort of a historic development and that kind of went in parallel to the developments in the learning sciences overseas, especially in the US, uh, that already engaged with uh, research and learning processes in a more um, sort of salient, explicit way. And I think this development has has been sort of growing also in, in the early community and the uh, field of learning and instruction and in higher education especially. Um, so I'm I, I think I could actually identify that as one of the developments that I've experienced throughout my career in the past decade. And I'm happy about it, obviously, because that means that um, the, the research that I've been conducting also together with my colleagues uh, has finally received an acknowledged space in, in our research um, community and research field, uh, which sort of also gives some, some legitimacy to the type of research that we're doing. and. Um, perhaps more and sort of better outlets for uh, making that research known to other researchers in the field. Another development which we are on all very uh, aware of, I think it's the, um, this very <laughs> sort of sustained um, entrance and uh, position of new technologies in in the field of in the educational field, and also which also has consequences for um, re educational research. And now we know that in higher education we are uh, more and more conducting or um, delivering education using learning management system, different different type of digital technologies and digital tools, and especially during and after the COVID period which <laughs> unfortunately is not yet, is not over, uh, we technologies have become an even more salient and um, uh, explicit element in, in our educational landscape. When it comes to the consequences for research, technologies have, have been there always, but I think we are looking at them in a different light and we learn to engage with them also for research purposes in a different light and um, having being surrounded by digital technologies um, in the field, in our own, so let's say, empirical context that we're studying, kind of uh, creates somehow uh, facilitates the research process. We we have some opportunities for, for example, collecting data that have not been considered before because it, they would have, they would have. Um, we would have sort of relied on, let's say, analog uh, approaches, while now technologies can make uh, data collection easier. Obviously, we have the, the, the field of um, technologies, digital technologies and 
tools for data analysis has simply exploded. We have so many, so many um, possibilities in uh, selecting tools and um, methods that are supported by the digital technologies when we analyze our data. At the same time, I think the technology also poses uh, <laughs> some type of challenges when it comes to educational research. And I would refer to the, this aspect of data privacy. Um, while we have this amazing opportunity to collect data and to analyze in, in very sophisticated ways, we are also have to be very aware of um, the way we, develop, we collect the data, the fact that not all the data can be used because while technology is uh, enable uh, uh, collecting different types of data, not everything is, or in any case, we have to be aware of the um, ethical aspect of um, what technology may be possible in our process, in our research, but uh, the hidden, the hidden dangers uh, behind it. And then a final development, which I think is generic uh, for the field of educational research and learning and instruction, research and learning and instruction especially is um, the development in the past years of new conceptualizations uh, of learning, especially of learning and of education. And I'm referring especially to um, ecological perspectives on learning and perhaps the post-humanist theories that are being uh, not necessarily developed, but elaborated and becoming more known in, in our field. And I think this is an, a development that impacts um, to a large extent, our research field. Uh, and I think the higher the research on higher education needs to take this into account as, um, as these conceptualizations and new theories kind of uh, uh, pose the idea of education, uh, learning, being part of a larger eco ecology of processes, uh, people, uh, structures and so on, contexts. Uh, and higher education, I believe, uh, without being a higher education governance researcher, I believe has has had a tendency to be a world in like in in, in itself uh, uh, with a very complicated structures and processes and very somehow almost self sufficient in that sense, uh, and almost being somehow. Um, in a, in a ivory tower, um, while now we see, and it's always been the case, it's just that now we become to acknowledge, begin to acknowledge that uh, we need to establish better, better connections and communication lines and ways of collaborating with the uh, with the world around us, uh, with the society we uh, we are part of, and I believe this this type of uh, conceptualizations and theories kind of make make these ideas more visible, more ex uh, more explicit, and also kind of challenge higher education and higher education research to um, acknowledge the role and the responsibility of higher education uh, at any level um, uh, in the society. And um, I think re research is, is the, um, the way to understand that role uh, even better. So this sort of development that may, may, may uh, appear a little disconnected from the concrete reality of higher education um, because it's it concerns learning theories or education theories is, I think actually is uh, very relevant for uh, for higher education research I absolutely agree thanks for outlining these big trends um, in your opinion what will be the most important questions you are continuing to work on what are your next goals regarding your research are they based in that field Absolutely. Obviously, I wouldn't identify these trends without having uh, learned about those myself, also through my research. I have, um, I think I, I can name three uh, research avenues that I'm pursuing right now in different ways. And they're also rather, yeah, you could say rather different um, topical orientations yet connected to each, interconnected. The first one is one that you already mentioned in the beginning of uh, this podcast, and it it's, uh, concerns more applied work uh, on collaborative learning in higher education. 
and the use of uh, learning analytics to support this type of learning and teaching and guidance of this type of learning. Uh, and this type of work I've been, it's sort of built on my doctoral uh, work. Um, I continued uh, perhaps on, I put, it, I put it on a slow burner, but I continued that work throughout the years, um, especially research on small group, group learning, that meaning how students learn when um, they, they work on group tasks, on complex problems, uh, or ill structure problems, how, how learning takes place, what is productive in that type of learning and how it can be guided and supported by technologies. And uh, this work is, is now has become very concrete um, as we, my colleague, Rachel Estegaziz, who's an associate professor and a SIG4 member, um, we received uh, funding for a large research project from the Research Council of Norway and will be conducting this, this type of research for the next uh, five years. Uh, we are looking specifically on how higher education students in um, professional higher education programs, and um, I can name legal education, medical education and nursing in this particular project, learn um, in, in small groups, in simulation settings, or uh, addressing sort of uh, very authentic problems from their uh, professional domain, how they learn to solve those problems in groups, and how that, that type of uh, process can be supported by learning analytics dashboard. So we want to provide some sort of automated feedback that is displayed, that is uh, created based on collecting uh, learning analytics data, and is displayed to a, a simple dashboard. So, and then how teachers uh, can actually guide um, students' work and um, by using also this uh, learning analytics dashboard. So this is a very somehow it is very exploratory work because we are we're tapping into a field um, that has been or that sort of uh, mixed. Uh, there is much research conducted on collaborative learning and small group learning. There's a sizable amount of research conducted on learning analytics. But what we're trying to do is to actually look at how we can combine learning analytics research where more qualitative approaches to uh, research on, on small group learning uh, in order to create formative interventions. So there is, um, so, so we can study, study their, their effect on learning. And there is, exploratory research work involved, there is uh, development work, so we're going to be developing pedagogical interventions, but also uh, technolo technology development. We're working to develop these learning analytic dashboards together with um, software developers at our university. Another area of research, the second one, is uh, clearly um, exploratory, exploratory research, and it's on the topic of what um, we coined, uh, me and my colleagues, platformization of education and learning. It's a metaphor, but in, in a way, it, it, I think it's quite, um, it's quite telling. Um, we are interested in uh, how digital platforms, which we're all familiar with, um, this could be learning management systems that I already mentioned, but also social, social, uh, social media platforms, are having an impact on how people and especially young people learn and also on how um, the educational context is dealing with these new developments in, in two different ways, uh, in, in how learners, and this could be uh, pupils or students or even professionals, uh, learn and use resources provided by, this, uh, by these platforms or uh, succumb to the challenges and to the sort of the temptations that these platforms may may provide may may also generate um, and the other aspect of the research is we try to understand the, um, the role and the function of platforms from the other end uh, of uh, platform developers how they think about the structure of a platform that that is, for instance, used in education, how they design it and how they Im implement it or uh, uh, sell it uh, to users. And also how higher education institutions or 
especially higher education institutions or and other institutional actors such as local governments actually deal with these platform providers in um, in the process of purchasing, um, making agreements, establishing uh, rights for the use of data, for example, of the users, and then implement it in, in educational context. Um, we we have we are working on a review um, together with um, with a number of colleagues here in Oslo, but also collaborators from from um, from Australia, for example, from Deakin University, where we we have identified many many uh, issues and especially ethical issues when it comes to um, data use, uh, personal privacy of the users, and especially of the young users. And the, the vulnerable position of educational institution and institutional actors in the relationship with platform providers. And that is due to many, many elements, which I'm not going to go into detail about right now, but also the legislation being not very clear on, on who is actually controlling um, uh, the platforms and uh, collecting the data and uh, managing that data. So this is a very interesting um, multi-layer project, but of course my 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 interest is always in how people learn with the platform. So that's that's the, the, the chunk of research that I am in charge of, and I have colleagues that are also sort of focusing on the other areas. But we work as an interdisciplinary team. And then the third area, and um, speaking of interdisciplinarity, is um, is actually on, on the field of interdisciplinary teaching and learning in higher education specifically. And this is um, research interest that has become, again, very concrete through um, after being granted funding in a number of projects, one of them being a large project on um, how higher education researchers and teachers um, collaborate to create interdisciplinary um, study programs. And this is specifically in the field of um, sustainable energy. So we are, uh, I am in a, in a large project where we are uh, studying this type of interdisciplinary collaborations together with uh, a number of colleagues. But we're also looking at how this type of knowledge um, is being disseminated beyond you know the higher education boundaries uh, of the institutions boundaries into into schools where um, research-based knowledge is being used to develop for example um, school curriculum for pupils to learn about sustainable energy approaches in any case this is an area of research that's that's very timely um, and it's also a, a challenging topic because there are so many layers in it. And this is also what makes it interesting. It's, it's, it's about how we, uh, as researchers from various fields, uh, address wicked problems in through research and how we engage in, in an inter interdisciplinary discourse that's actually uh, productive. And one of my colleagues uses the notion of academic hospitality um, to um, examine uh, at this phenomenon. Um, and by that we mean there is a need for understanding each other, but we have to actually we have to actually learn how to understand each other and then develop skills in engaging into that in this interdisciplinary discourse, taking into account every field, every domain's contributions. Um, but that we're also in, in this area of research and in the projects um, that are, are um, part of it, we're looking at how that research knowledge, interdisciplinary research knowledge is also being used by teachers in higher education to create these study offers and what are the challenges of pedag for pedagogical design that involves multiple disciplinary fields. It's definitely not a trivial challenge. And then, um, Closer to my my uh, research expertise is how students engage in interdisciplinary learning, how the study offers the study programs that have a interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary nature um, enroll students and how students are um, perceiving that that um, study offer. What are the challenges and how they actually uh, enact this type of uh, 
learning processes that are implied by um, this type of approach. So again, this is a rather complex research area and a, a rather research uh, complex research topic. But as I mentioned already, I am um, involved in various interdisciplinary collaborations in different teams where uh, colleagues bring in their research expertise from other disciplinary areas, which makes it a very enriching uh, learning experience as well. That sounds great. I, I really like that you're um, collaborating with a lot of researchers in various fields um, to proceed, per, proceed these projects. Um, they sound very promising, but also very challenging at the same time. Let's move on to our third thematic area about your involvement in early and advice you might have for younger researchers. Um, what does being a part of early mean to you and what are your most memorable experiences when you think of early? Uh, yes, um, early has been um, definitely a community for me from the very beginning. Uh, it has been first and foremost an academic community. It's my academic home in the European context. Uh, this is where I, um, I have the opportunity to present my research, to learn about research being conducted in, in the European context in the field of uh, research on learning and instruction. Also, it offers um, the possibility as a community to identify collaborators, colleagues who work on, are interested in the same uh, topical areas, or methodological approaches or um, conceptual conceptualizations um, and identify them as collaborators, which in my case has had happened <laughs> on many occasions. So that aspect of uh, uh, the, the community in, in, in multiple, uh, multiple sense I, uh, is what I definitely think of when I think of early. At the same time, there is this aspect of early being uh, somehow the, the home ground for high quality European research. It's, it's perhaps also an aspect of the community, but perhaps it's more than just that. This is the place where researcher, researchers conducting um, research on learning and instruction at a, at a high standard, a quality standard are meeting and showing their research, presenting their work. Um, and I think it's, it's an invaluable asset for, the, for, the Europe, for European research and educational research uh, in Europe to have this, uh, this um, organization. Because um, as we know, we have, we have sort of this type of associations also on other continents, AERA in, in the Northern American continent is obviously the most famous one. I think early provides the sort of the, is the correspondent of, of that in Europe. And it, it some, somehow balances out also the, you know, the, I could almost say power relations between the continents, but this is a good thing because it means that we, we do have high quality research that we can, we can put out there and uh, I think it is early that offers that that outlet, um, and I, I've always been uh, very fond of early because I've I've been learning so much from it, and that's perhaps the third element uh, in the way I perceive early and um, for the reason for appreciating it is is a source of learning experiences when it comes to learning about other people's work, learning about new topical areas, about new work, about new methodologies, about very sound way of uh, using those or uh, applying those in, in research studies. Uh, so early means a lot to me, uh, having been part of it since I was um, a Jura uh, scholar. So when it comes to experiences, I mean, again, there are, there are many things that I could name, but if I cluster them a little, I could say that the social, the, at social level, um, I definitely think of my entrance into the Jura community as being a memorable experience. Jura has been uh, a place where I felt welcome, like 
just like probably many other young scholars uh, feel. Um, and I, I really developed, I started developing my network there uh, and I, I definitely recall it as a very fond memory uh, meeting up with uh, other young scholars, both in academic but also in social context related to especially to the, to the conference. Another memorable experience is when that has more of a social social nature is one of the presidential dinners, the, the first and only presidential dinner I've been part of. As you know, the, the uh, presidents of early meet together with C coordinators and other members with uh, sort of leading responsibilities and have um, have a dinner during the conferences. And of course, there is it's an arena to discuss um, research uh, matters, but also to socialize. And I just remember being so impressed and overwhelmed by meeting all these, you know, famous scholars that I've been reading about and not not have met before in person and having have, talking to them and learning learning about their their experiences with early. It's just been so sort of yeah, I definitely made a mark uh, in my memories about early. When it comes to academic memorable experiences, I think I'll be short about this, but I think I, I want to name three. And one is um, a panel session on peer review organized by SIG25 at the Aachen conference uh, in Germany, uh, which had such a high attendance. Uh, it was just unbelievable. I was part of the panel and it, it made an impression on me because I realized how interested and committed early researchers are uh, to, you know, these processes that have to do with, with, with our research profession and uh, research work. Everyone was, was active and it was a very, sort of very uh, lively discussion and it was actually a debate. I really appreciated the involvement and the engagement of, of, of everyone uh, and I was again uh, impressed by the, by the attendance. Another experience it's perhaps memorable but it's it's also telling about early um is the organization of uh, the early 2021 conference which was supposed to take place in Göteborg but did in the end did not because of covid and needed to be organized online and it was a very short time between the decision of organizing it online um and ac the actual date of the conference so i was at part of the early board at the, at the time of the executive committee and everyone, the board, the local uh, local uh, conference uh, committee, SIG coordinators, uh, many others in sort of leadership role, but not only, also regular members mobilized and uh, put their efforts together to organize this conference online because the local organization committee could have not done it um alone um in in those circumstances i felt i felt the spirit of solidarity i was really impressed and of course it was again a, a rich learning experience for me but i felt that this is a community that while we're scattered across europe in different countries different cultures different contexts um with different responsibilities and uh commitments and challenges we we have that solidarity and we come together when it's necessary to keep the community going and then, of course, I'll mention the recent joint keynote in the SIG 1 and 4 conference in Cadiz because um, this was my first major um, keynote. I've been giving keynote talks before, but in, in sort of more uh, limited context. And this is, is memorable and will stay memorable because of, of the fact that it was a joint keynote together with uh, Naomi Winston uh, and the way both the organizers um, framed this keynote. They tried to bring two communities together and it was a risk taken there because these are two very different communities in a sense um, in the two SIGs, but also it was a challenge and it was uh, a lot of potential there. And the collaboration with Naomi was, was very sort of very interesting and uh, productive and it, it resulted in a hopefully a, an interesting keynote and it, it felt also again I had this feeling of um, the community of people coming together and listening to a keynote that was definitely not a regular one people didn't know what to expect yet they were there and they were interested and 
contribute to the discussion and uh, appreciated also our efforts. So I, I, uh, I thought it was a very rewarding and again, memorable moment. I think so too, that it was very rewarding and also very insightful. Um, last but not least, could you give some advice for future higher education researchers? Some top tips. <laughs> I definitely not feel I'm in the position to give advice. I am I am not that advanced to my career myself, um, uh, but I, I have reflections obviously related to developments in the field of research on learning and instruction. And this is mainly because the higher education field is undergoing shifts. Like I think the educational field in and the society in general, but the higher education, especially in terms of um, governance models, criteria for evaluation of research, but also of education. Uh, when it comes to the role of higher education as an institution in the society, as I mentioned before, and that's specifically related to the type of competences that graduates need to have uh, in a current changing society and economy and uh, rather complex and wicked problems that um, graduates need to to address and engage and work with when they when they are out of the higher institutions um, uh, uh, context so i think higher education is uh is at a sort of at a crossroad in many ways uh in our times and also this also has consequences for for us as researchers um in in this particular field so i think that it might sound trivial, but I think that we need to be very aware and consider carefully how our research addresses some of these new developments, both in terms of topical focus, but also in, in the methodologies that we use. Um, I don't think we should uh, shift our topical interests in once. Obviously, we can't, if we are experimental researchers and we focus in on a particular type of uh, a way of studying, uh, education and learning instructions, we can't just shift that overnight, but it's about taking into consideration this sort of <laughs> ecology in which this, the processes and, um, and the uh, outcomes that we study are, are uh, part of. Um, so taking perhaps this more ecological perspective on, on the process, on the phenomena that we study. And I guess that has also consequences for the way we study, so for the methodology. So I would I would say more taking a step back and looking at where we are, where we are positioned as higher education researchers in the broader um, higher education field as an empirical context, but also in the broader field of research on higher education. So I think there is much more, it's always been need, but now we're much more aware of, for instance, that being a, a researcher on uh, student trajectories and student performance is should be seen in the context of societal developments, uh, social economical um, context, the university's um, position in the society, uh, the role of the university when it comes to preparing graduates, the background of the students. And I think this is already happening in our field. I recall a special issue being um, published not long ago in the in frontline learning research um, and uh, by SIG4 colleagues, uh, which has been taking this uh, more sort of more multi-layered perspective. But I think this is, it's something we cannot avoid and we should all be considerate of the need of engaging with our field of research in that way. The other, the other possible, uh, the other reflection that could, could be advice is, uh, considering the value of interdisciplinarity and the need to actually uh, engage it, um, especially in the higher education context. Um, I, I believe that this, there's always been a need for an interdisciplinarity or a multidisciplinary approach in, in higher education um, and consequently also for higher education research. Uh, but I think now we are becoming much more aware of how uh, complex problems that we are examining and and their dynamics. Let's think of climate change, uh, of um, social 
socioeconomical issues and so on that we are experiencing at the moment have an impact on how education is being shaped and the fact that we cannot understand this this phenomena and their con the consequences for education uh, without taking into consideration uh, knowledge from other fields that tell us uh, tell us let's say enrich our our understanding of those phenomena um, so I, I believe that this is definitely a, a development that we cannot ignore and that we need to focus on um, as higher education research researchers as well and then finally I, I stay by three three is the magic number obviously <laughs> um, it's it's about the value of our research uh, for uh, decision making decision makers in higher education and not only policy makers as well i believe that we are um, we are an invaluable resource for higher education and for the society and i i, I really strongly advise myself uh, i think this is definitely something I, I i have to work on more and perform better at uh, and advise others to to get their research and research um, learning lessons from from their research out there in the world uh, there to to promote research there to step up to decision makers in in higher education uh, to policy makers and present research-based knowledge uh, that can support uh, informed decisions about education in this particular case i think we have been for many years too shy or um, to to promote our research perhaps there has not been uh, so much space for doing so but we see now also given the the new trends in the society where mistrust towards research is growing in a, in a segment of the population at the same time policymakers seeking seeking um, not research based knowledge I see uh, an opportunity for us to actually um, make our research put it to put it to use. I think this is a, a wonderful final word. Uh, thank you so, so much, Krina. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to you. I hope that all our listeners appreciate this conversation as much as I did. Thanks again for taking the time. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to talk to you as well. This is a podcast produced by the European Association for Research on Learning and Instruction in collaboration with the Institute of Business Education and Educational Management and the Media Lab at the University of St. Gallen. Thank you for listening and see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.